So thanks for, for the organizers to invite me because I was asked to speak about a topic which is, I think, as one of the few topics uh, th this uh, conference is not really about genetics or genomics, but I'll try to talk it into it anyway. Um, a critical rare view, well, that's always very good to be critical. Um, and the story is that we are now more and more involved in work on dietary patterns. But what do we mean with dietary patterns? I think that as a classical epidemiologist or food scientist, we are usually concerned about foods and food groups because that's also the things we ask from our participants. If you recall what you ate yesterday in terms of foods, people buy foods, they don't buy nutrients. But we calculate the nutrients using the dedicated food tables. And I think the nutrients are still very relevant, especially also in gene-diet interactions. I'll come back to that later. Nowadays, we're also more concerned with dietary patterns, and perhaps also, but I'm not going to discuss this now, with other aspects of eating behavior, which might be relevant, for, especially, for example, for obesity. So why did we get interested in food patterns anyway? I think you have to realize, and most of you do probably, that the intake of nutrients in foods within a diet is usually highly correlated. So diets high in fiber tend to be high in vitamin C and folate, but also carotenoids, magnesium and potassium. And we also know, because that's because of the, the fact that you eat more plant foods, but diets in whole grain also tend to be low in meat intake, because that's typically for a vegetarian diet, for example. So actually, if you look at individual nutrients or foods, we ignore the potential of interactions between dietary components and also in its relationship with chronic disease. And of course, we eat nutrients. We don't eat nutrients, we eat foods. And we, we eat them in certain patterns. So actually, that was about 10 to 15 years ago, the rationale for starting studying dietary patterns in relation to chronic disease outcomes. What do we want it to do? Well, also we want to identify high-risk groups. There's also, there's also a certain public health relevance to this topic. Also, people who are interested in breast cancer wanted to focus on dietary patterns because there were not specific nutrients known to be associated with breast cancer, so they want to have an idea about how it would all be when it is combined into a pattern. The same is true for people like me who are interested in coronary heart disease. There are so many nutrients which may play a role that you want to see the full picture. And that's why you want to look at some sort of clustering or a pattern. Often, and this is also done in other studies, perhaps with genetics, you want to summarize diet not in 48 food groups or in 40 nutrients or in 178 uh, items of your food frequency questionnaire, but you want to have one variable to be able to adjust for diet, so you want to have some a variable which can act as a confounder in your data analysis. And a final reason, and you can question mark this, is that in this way you can also validate dietary recommendations. Because if you have a pattern which is associated or which is based on a dietary recommendation and it's associated with a health outcome, you can infer that this dietary recommendation is correct. Actually, there are two main different approaches to study dietary patterns. And the first one is data-driven, and it's empirically derived, so a posteriori. So you can do a factor analysis or related technique, statistical techniques such as principal component analysis, and what you do is data reduction, and you reduce the number of variables in your data set. Or you can use cluster analysis, and you also work on data reduction, and you cluster subjects in groups. And note that, for example, cluster analysis is also highly used in the, the analysis, analysis of uh, nutrigenomics data, for example, transcriptomics data. The last one, or the second one, is the content-driven dietary pattern. And it's based on theory, a priori, so to speak. And we call it often diet quality scores. So they can be based on recommended diets or on dietary guidelines. I speak a little bit on the dietary patterns based on the data, although I was not asked to do it, but it was just a quick overview to see if, for example, in cluster analysis, it means that you divide your study population into a limited number of groups with a maximum differing dietary pattern. And we did it once, uh, quite a while ago, 1995, and we looked at it in our data from the Zutphen Elderly Study, a study of elderly men. 
just to show you how it works, you have to think about which dietary vari variable you want to include, how you standardize them, how to select a cluster, and find out the right number of clusters that is required to explain as much of the variance in your data set as possible. In the end, we came up with four clusters. An alcohol cluster, which was high in alcohol intake, and we call it alcohol cluster, mind you, that is subjective, eh? how, I, how I call the clusters. A meat cluster, in where the people had high saturated fat intake, high monounsaturated fat intake, not from olive oil, mind you, in the Netherlands, but from uh, the dairy and the meat, and high dietary cholesterol. There was a healthy diet cluster, which was high in polysaccharides and fiber, and somehow what we called refined sugar cluster, because it was high in oligosaccharides, probably also because of the dairy. Um, the only thing what we found significant is that the HDL cholesterol was higher in the subjects with the high alcohol cluster, so that validates a little bit this clustering, because we know from all kinds of studies that alcohol increases your HDL cholesterol. But we couldn't find any association or any relationship or different risk factor level in the other clusters. Now you can also do factor analysis and then you make more variables, of uh, less variables out of a, a set of very, uh, quite many variables, which we call sometimes so-called latent underlying random quantities, which are called, called factors. Again, you have to make important decisions, which are to some extent also quite arbitrary. So what foods do you put in or do you make a factor score of nutrients or foods or food groups? How many factors do you want to extract? Depends on your data, of course. You can rotate the factor scores to make them um, mutually independent, but there's several ways of doing it. And also, how do you call the scores? There's other factors that's also kind of arbitrary or somehow subjective. We also had experience with this factor analysis, and we did this in the Dutch population, uh, a bigger one than the previous example. And we saw that some dietary patterns were associated with high blood pressure and plasma glucose and cholesterol, especially the healthy factor score. So it seems to work out quite nicely. But there are some difficulties with this. So the strength is that you summarize your behavior across several variables into small independent variables, orthogonal, which means also statistically independent. But there's also a limitation, and it's the same with cluster analysis, that the results are very sample specific. So if I would do the same in another study in England, in the United States, or here in Spain, I definitely would get different clusters, different factors. And it's like I said, affected by, to some extent, arbitrary decisions. Although, when you describe it well, when you do it well, you can really make a good framework. So, Another disadvantage is that um, we don't know much about the stability of dietary patterns across population group. I already told you, and I think Frank Hu did some data analysis in the Boston data sets when they showed that at least over time there was some stability over time. And another disadvantage is, of course, that these patterns may not necessarily represent the ideal diets, if you wish to study so, because it depends on the correlations in your data set at hand but they do identify and reflect the actual practice of the population in your study. There are some new developments in this field which I would like to mention, and this is something which is called reduced rank regression, which makes use of the PLS, the partial least squares, and I think Dominique Languin showed something with PLS discriminatory analysis when his, in his data set. You can do the same with dietary variables, of course. And this reduced rank regression makes factors predicting diet variables and continuous outcomes together. <coughs> so actually you put in a prior knowledge because you decide which biochemical variable can serve as somehow an intermediate. And then it focuses, so you can focus on the pathway to which the diet may influence your disease. And this is first suggested by the late Kurt Hoffmann in this paper published I think, 2004, yeah. Okay, now the diet quality, what's about this? This is about food patterns which are based on the theory. And actually there are quite many. We reviewed them a couple of years ago uh, with some of my colleagues. 
Uh, and at that time, and now even there are even more, but there were at least 20 indexes published so far. So when you're thinking about genetics and you want to look at gene-diet interaction and you want to summarize diet in a diet quality score, it's perhaps very difficult to decide what you should do. Now you have to remember that some of them are really based on the diet quality, based on recommended, um, recommended diets come back to that later. But there are also, and these ones are the same, this one is a specific one and quite, you know, <coughs> appropriate here in uh, Spain, the Mediterranean diet scores. Uh, maybe it's also good to note that yesterday I was watching television and it seems now that the UN has put on the World Heritage List uh, the Mediterranean diet. That's good news, I think, for Spain. Also the French cuisine, which is good for the French people here, and also the Spanish flamenco. So. I think <laughs> we are on the right day today to talk about Mediterranean diets here in Spain. The Mediterranean diet scores, such as the one from Antonia Tricopoulou from Athens in Greece uh, and several other ones. And there are also some scores which are more nutrient based, based on nutrient pyramids or nutrient adequacy ratio. So those are more based on foods and more based on nutrients. The healthy eating index is quite often used. Nowadays there is a refined, revised healthy eating index, but the principle works the same. So it measures the quality of the dietary intake as a high score indicating a healthy diet and a low score indicating an unhealthy diet. But there are also some newer ones. There is a score reflecting the DASH diet. Remember the DASH trial, uh, the dietary approach, approach to stop hypertension. There is the Nordic diet, which is somehow the Mediterranean diet, but then specific for the Nordic countries. Um, there's even an inflammation diet score, and we are currently working ourselves uh, on a Dutch healthy diet index and a revised version of this inflammation diet score. This is again the healthy eating index as first proposed in 1995. What you see here is typical for any of these indexes. So on the left column you see the, the component, and this was based on the, the dietary guidelines in the United States at that time. So it was about the intake of grains, vegetables, fruits, milk, meat, and then the nutrients, total fat, saturated fatty acids, cholesterol, sodium, and also an indicator about the variety of the diet, because it was recommended to have a variety, a diet variety. The scoring was decided that the minimum was zero and the upper limit was 10, you see here the range. And the criteria for a score of zero is indicated here and the criteria for a score of 10, the maximum score is based on the third column. So you see, for example, for saturated fatty acids that you scored zero, so very low, when your diet was fifth, more than 50 of energy percent of saturated fat. And you scored the maximum score of 10 when your diet was containing saturated fatty acids less than 10 energy percent, and so on. And then, of course, it was proportional. So if you were in the middle halfway, this 10 and this 15, you got five points on this scale, so to speak. Actually, uh, these scores are, um, well, like I said, not only a little bit arbitrary, but necessarily so, because it's the only thing you can do. And we got also our own experience in Europe, and we tried to do it with the WHO dietary guidelines for the prevention of chronic disease. And again, we did make this, a diet score, which uh, measured the agreement between the dietary intake of the subjects and these dietary guidelines. And we made it even more simple. We made nine components. One, if a person meets the item of the guideline, and zero, when a person did not. Again, quite old paper. We looked at it in Finland, Italy, and the Netherlands. Here you see the guidelines which were in vogue at that time, and of course still are, most of them saturated fatty acids. Again, here the 10%. So if you're below 10%, you scored a one, which is good. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, not too high, not too low. Protein, not too high, not too low. Relatively high carbohydrates. Dietary fiber, here you see the fruits and vegetables together. Pulses, nuts, and seeds were then in the guideline. The mono and, di and disaccharides are always a difficult thing, but at the, those time in the guidelines it was about 10 energy percent, but of course you can discuss. And here's the cholesterol. You see here overall, if we combine the data in the total population, the black dots, we saw a nice inverse association. So the higher the score, so the more healthy the diet of the, uh, of the subjects, the lower the all-cause mortality. So that's a good thing, you would say. 
On the other hand, and that's also a warning if we want to do multi-center studies or studies in different countries, that if you look in Finland, for example, here, there is not a much range in, a smaller range in variation. It goes down, but it was not statistically significant. And the same was here in the Netherlands, when the relationship was also a little bit awkward. So overall, there was inverse associations in all the countries, but it was the most clear when we pooled them. Our conclusions, you can focus at the white arrows for today, is that the dietary pattern as a whole seems to be more important than specific dietary components, because we looked at the specific dietary components, and none of them was able to explain this reduced mortality. So this would, at one hand, suggest that indeed the sum is more than, the whole is more than <coughs> the sum of its parts, maybe, or that you really have to have the sum of all these parts to obtain this mortality effect. We can also conclude, but that's also a little bit for discussion maybe, that the WHO dietary recommendations for this prevention of chronic disease are effective, because if you score people like this, they have lower mortality. And you can use this predefined score in a cross-cultural setting. And I think that's a bit an advantage compared to what you do with cluster or factor analysis. Another traditional European example, like I said already, is the Mediterranean diet score. And this is a score by, made by Antonia. And you can see here, this is the ratio of monounsaturated fatty acids to saturated fatty acids to indicate the olive oil indication, the, the olive oil consumption in the Mediterranean area. This is what we did in the elderly study. Well, actually, I can discuss with people in Spain that if the score from Mediterranean diet is made like this, if you agree that this is a typical Mediterranean diet score, I don't know, but I've been at conferences where there was a heavy debate about which is really the Mediterranean diet. Is it found here? But you can say it's found around in the Mediterranean basin, so to speak. But of course, there are very big differences. I think in Spain, for example, the meat intake is much higher than in several other countries in the Mediterranean area. So we looked at the Mediterranean diet in these various populations, and we looked at the 10-year mortality. So actually, the men and women, they had a median diet score of four. And how come? It was the Mediterranean group, but notice what with this, in this trick, you use the median value of your population to say it's okay or it's not okay. So it's, mean, it's not based on absolute score like we did before, but this one is based on the median levels of your study population. So if we do this study in the Netherlands, our men or our women who score above the median, we can call them they have a Mediterranean-like intake of olive oil, but of course, this not comes near the real olive oil intake as we have really in the Mediterranean area. So it's nice, but you have to remember that in, in, when you do this in the Northern Europe, the people you end up with, with a high score, are not necessarily the ones who would really have a Mediterranean diet, so it's more like called Mediterranean type of diet, so to speak. So what we did is we looked at the mortality rate, and the people who scored higher on the Mediterranean diet, they had a reduced mortality. You can see this here, relative risk, one is the reference, so they have a 23% reduction. If you look at physical activity, there is a bigger reduction, alcohol a reduction, and non-smoking, of course, the strongest reduction. So it seems to work, uh, and it seems not to work as strong as physical activity or non-smoking. I'm not so much surprised, because I think also when we are in the diet field, we look at relatively subtle effects. So if you look at all-cause mortality, you can imagine that the effect on mortality is not as big as refraining from smoking, for example. A nice thing to hear, show here that in the same paper we also added them up and we saw, saw that the elderly people with all four of healthy habits had really uh, a more than 60% uh, reduction in mortality. So this means that even in elderly people, 60% of mortality can be uh, uh, avoided, so to speak. 60% uh, of the 10-year mortality can be avoided because in the end, of course, everybody dies. Every relative risk will end up being one. To focus on the Mediterranean diet, there's also another one, and it's just to show you how these discussions are, because there's also proposed by uh, Flaminio Fidanza in Italy, something which is called the Mediterranean Adequacy Index Ratio. And there you look at the intake of Mediterranean food groups, which are defined as uh, eating bread, cereals, legumes, potatoes, <coughs> vegetables, fruit, vegetable oils, and wine and you compare them to the intake of the non-Mediterranean food groups, milk, cheese, eggs, animal fat and margarine, beer, spirits, cakes, pies, cookies, sugar, meat, and poultry. 
standardized, well, they are in grams a day, and standardized to a mean intake of 2,500 kilocalories for men and 2,000 a day for women. Actually, in the same data set, we looked at the Mediterranean diet score from Antonia and the, the one from Flaminio, and he show exactly the same results. So from that point of view, I don't think that one score is better than the other, at least based on our own data. So one of our interim conclusions here is that adherence to a Mediterranean-like diet can be beneficial for survival, and a combination with a healthy lifestyle re reduces the risk a bit more than 50%. Now, this is interesting, and I all briefly discussed with uh, Mike Gibney already. This is an observational study, and so this is, you know, full of confounding. We corrected for it as best as we can, but sure, what way you can, can you do with a Mediterranean diet? It's not really uh, done in an experiment yet. Of course, there have been experiments. Uh, the one which it's from uh, the people from Lyon, which showed a reduction in the coronary heart disease. What we were interested in is more like what is the underlying mechanism? Now, on the left, you have the slides from previously that with Mediterranean diet, you have this reduction in disease, in all-cause mortality, but also in coronary heart disease mortality. And we did actually, for a couple of years ago, an intervention study, a well-controlled intervention study among 60 subjects, which were randomized into three diets. One was a, a Dutch, typical Dutch diet, high in saturated fat. The second group had the same diet, but then part of the saturated fat was exchanged for um, monounsaturated fat, so olive oil. And the third group, which I was a member, actually I was in this study, uh, had a full Mediterranean diet, and that was you know, not blind because I knew I was in the Mediterranean diet because I had to eat differently and every night I had a, a bottle of wine, which was part of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, but it was clearly randomized, of course, so the, my PhD student was just, uh, luckily enough, she put me in uh, my favorite group, the Mediterranean diet group. And you see here on the right, down on the left, on the right, sorry, you see the results. Um, fairly simple for the ratio of total to HDL cholesterol and for the ratio of ApoB to ApoA1. And you see here that compared to the saturated fat, the monounsaturated fat, as expected, reduces both ratios. And interestingly, the Mediterranean diet, which included also more uh, fish, uh, more legumes and vegetables, more nuts, and like I said, also some red wine, reduced this ratio even more, and also the ratio of ApoB to ApoA1. Uh, we try to figure out, and that's also, of course, a disadvantage when you manipulate the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean like this. Then the next question is, well, it's not the olive oil, but what is it outside of the olive oil? Uh, well, we don't know, but we can guess. May, based on the alcohol content, we cannot say that it's fully explained by the uh, increase in uh, HDL by alcohol intake. There should be something else involved. And that's also why we did some nutrigenomics analysis, transcriptomics, so to speak. So we took fat biopsy and muscle biopsies. The results are a little bit difficult to explain. I didn't bring the slides with me. What we see in general, that if you have the saturated fat diet, you have more pattern like pro-inflammatory factors, so to speak. If you want some more details, I can talk about that later, but this is not part of my task for today. But so there is, um, well, we have some experience with making also, if you have a dietary pattern, in trying to make it in an experiment to see, to really see what you uh, uh, can get. Now, like I said, um, the cluster analysis and the factor analysis they involve some arbitrary choices, but often people forget that this is also the case when we look at these dietary patterns or diet quality scores. So again, we have to decide which food groups or nutrients we put in the score. We have to decide about the cutoff values. Actually, um, also about the exact quantification of the index com components judged against the cutoff points. In the Mediterranean diet, it's simply a zero or a one, so yes, you comply or no, you comply. In the healthy eating index from the United States, it's a scale from zero to 10, so it's a little bit <coughs> more refined. You have to discuss whether or not you want to adjust for energy intake, and there's some more technical details. But the last one is very interesting. And I challenge the nutrition scientists in our group to discuss about this or think about this, because you have to decide on the relative contribution of the individual components to the total score. 
So what we did, like in the Mediterranean Diet Score, but what we did also in a healthy diet indicator, we looked at the WHO recommendations, and every recommendation got the same weight. If you comply with the, regular, the rule for saturated fat intake, it's as important as to comply with the, with the recommendation for fiber intake, for example. And of course, I don't think this is really true, but it also depends on the health outcome you're interested in. And I think we don't know enough yet, or we should know a little bit more, I think, about how to weigh these uh, relative contributions, so how to look at the dietary recommendations. Now, it can happen if you don't find an association between the pattern and the health outcome. So if you see this in a paper, I suggest you take a look at the method, what they use for the food consumption, because it's garbage in, garbage out, of course. So if you don't measure it well, it's very difficult to get a good pattern out of it. You want also to see whether a health-relevant pattern is derived. And of course, that's very, uh, definitely is the case when you do cluster of factor analysis. You have to take that into account. You also have to check the biology. Can you reject the hypothesis that this pattern is associated with health outcome is based on the biology? Can you reject this hypothesis or not? And it's important to check the method of the pattern. And overall, and this bullet, I actually I forgot, is that is always a possibility, and we need to know more about this, but groups like this work on this, is look at the underlying genetics of your subjects. Because all the studies I have shown so far looked at subjects and looked at their diet and their health outcome, but they didn't look at the genetic susceptibility. And it is, of course, likely, that's why we are here, that people with certain genes are more or less susceptible. We did our own work on fatty acids, and for example, the fatty acid desaturase gene, and we saw really interesting interaction effects in relation between saturated fat in order of monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat intake, especially the N minus three, and the total uh, in LDL and HDL cholesterol. So, if you are interested in gene diet interactions, again, this diet summarizing your dietary in information into one variable. Um, well, you can do it as I've showed you now, but it's also very a tricky thing to do. So from that point of view, stay a little bit, I would advise you to stay a little bit closer to the biology and try to look at the individual nutrients um, to make this uh, more clear. So in conclusion, these dietary patterns are a new kit on the block and they're here to stay. But especially relevant, I think, for public health oriented research and perhaps not so much in etiology. These methodological challenges, they remain, but there are new statistical tools which may help. And of course, the method you will use will depend on the goal. I think also in relation to obesity, we have to take into account there are also other aspects of diet and dietary intake, which are maybe part of what we think is a dietary pattern, but we never take them into account when doing a 24-hour recall or food frequency uh, questionnaire, because you know, there's about the meal pattern, there's the time of the day, the location, are they sitting for the television, are they eating slowly or eating rapidly, especially for obesity, this make, can make a big difference, and I think we're only about begin, to begin with um, investigating this more clearly. And my final recommendation is that in multi-center studies, at least across different cultures, different countries, you better use a predefined score. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll take the questions afterwards. Okay.